This month on 219 West, street fashion this fall is not necessarily what you think. Bow ties and button downs, not for men only anymore. Also, if you can game it here, how the geeks hope to make New York the next capital of video game development. Plus, Kalunga, a musical group that is helping people from a divided island find common roots. Hello and welcome to this month's edition of 219 West, the monthly news magazine produced by the students of the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism for CUNY TV. I'm Judy Lee. And I'm Anais Morales. We'll have all of these stories coming up, plus a new way to rep your hood and a New York family with a knack for turning ordinary objects into elegant masterpieces. But first, this year marks the 85th anniversary of the Feast of San Gennaro. But 10 years ago, for the first and only time in history, the festival was canceled. The date was September 13, 2001, two days after the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center. John Frada is a lifelong resident of Little Italy, where the festival is held. He is the great-grandson of the festival's founder. Earlier, he spoke to Judy Lee. Okay, so John, um, can you take us back 10 years to September 13th, 2001? What happened and, and kind of what you were doing? Well, we were getting ready to, uh, before September 13th, uh, that was supposed to be the first day of the St. Gennaro Feast in 2001. But of course, uh, September 11th happened and uh, it was just, uh, it was a decision that was made to cancel the feast which was the first time in the history of the feast since 1926 that the feast was ever canceled. Um, this feast went on during the Depression. It went on during World War II, Korea. We've never canceled it, but it would have been a disgrace. It would have been un unconscionable to really have a celebration when so many people got killed and, uh, and that tragedy happened in New York. So. Um, Instead of celebrating on September 13th, uh, everybody was doing something else for the cause. Um, and although you know we, we wanted to honor St. Gennaro, which we do every year, uh, what we wound up doing in 2001 was honoring St. Gennaro uh, and going into church and asking for one more miracle of St. Gennaro to try to bring some peace and harmony and, and of course, praying for the people that we lost. Many people from our community uh, got killed in 9-11, and it was, it was a real tragedy for us. And where were you during that time? Believe it or not, I was running for city council, and uh, I was campaigning when it happened. And needless to say, as soon as those planes hit, the election ended, and uh, we got into a mode of we had to help people uh, I live in a 27-story building, 1,600 families. So we had a lot of seniors. So from campaigning, we started climbing upstairs because we had no electric to make sure seniors were okay. Uh, it, it was a terrible day, a day that we'll probably, I'll never forget. Uh, it's, it's etched in our memory, as, uh, especially seeing the towers come down. Well, I was there last year, and I saw a lot of people, vendors, commemorating um, people they lost. Do you see a lot of that happening? Oh, absolutely. Uh, because we're down there, we're downtown, uh, a lot of the people from our community worked at the World Trade Center, and a lot of people from our community were first responders. So, you know, they got killed during 9-11. Uh, uh, a lot of our people are still being killed who went down and worked on the piles, and they're coming down with these diseases and everything else. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's still a very difficult day. It's a difficult day for all New Yorkers, for all Americans, but it's a much more difficult day for our community and for Lower Manhattan because we lost so many. So let's bring it to this year. It's the 85th anniversary. Can you tell me a little bit about what we are going to expect? Yeah, this year is going to be an, an exciting feast. Uh, we made a lot of changes to the St. Gennaro Feast. We're going to be, um, we're going to have a whole block dedicated to Italian art and culture. Uh, that's uh, Mulberry between Prince and Houston. It's being done in conjunction with the Basilica of St. Patrick's, uh, the old cathedral, and uh, Two Bridges Neighborhood Council. They're putting it together. Uh, we're going to have a lot of Italian entertainment, a lot of Italian music, 
Uh, we're trying to bring back to the feast the feeling that you had uh, when, I, like when I was growing up. And what, what was that feeling? Uh, it was more of a neighborhood feast. It, it, was, um, it, it was something you look forward to every year. Um, you got families came back to the neighborhood that moved out. You saw friends and family members that you haven't seen in a while. Uh, and it had a lot to do with our culture. Can you tell me um, when the dates are this year and how long it is? Yeah, the feast starts September 15th to the 25th. It's from 11.30 in the morning until 11.30 at night. We had to curtail it, uh, the hours, because of complaints in the community, and rightly so. And um, it's good, it's, it runs from Mulberry Street from Canal to Houston. It's not shortened. And, <laughs> uh, and, and it, again, it's going to be a great feast. Thank you, John, for joining us, and hopefully I'll see you at the feast. Great. Look forward to that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay. From the tourist attractions to the trendy neighborhoods, Brooklyn has enjoyed a renaissance over the last 10 years. Many Brooklynites and some non-natives are using clothes to show their king-sized pride. 219 West reporter Tammy Cozier has a story. New Yorkers love showing pride for their city. They've been representing the Big Apple with I Love New York t-shirts since the design was debuted in 1977. The logo is one of the most recognizable designs in the world. But today, some new city-inspired designs are making a bold statement. And it's all about Brooklyn. Brooklyn's kind of known the world over and has uh, become the, the hip spot, I guess, outside of Manhattan these days. So. I've been living here for 20 years and I just find it an interesting landscape to draw uh, my designs from. The name of Hildebrand's clothing line, Live Poultry, was inspired by the fresh fowl farms in Greenpoint and Red Hook. The graphic artist is one of several local designers that use Brooklyn's culture and architecture as their muse. Some of the designs I've used that are the more popular ones are the Kentile Floor sign, which is down in Gowanus, which everyone seems to have some memory or recollection of, often from their childhood. The clothing line features a number of Brooklyn icons, such as Sunset Park's water towers and Red Hook's industrial landmark sign. Yeah, they've got some really good stuff. I also have the water tank one. When I see, when I see clothing, that is original and done by people from the area, and it represents the area. I really appreciate that. Another iconic image of Brooklyn is inspiring custom gear. Coney Island is completely unique. It just has so much flavor. Part of that flavor is the Coney Island Circus Sideshow, one of the few remaining sideshows in the U.S. Pratt Productions teamed with the sideshow owners Coney Island USA to create a line of clothing called, what else, Coney Island. It's just fun, it's funky, it's a little bit bad. It's just all this stuff. It's my favorite Coney Island line shirts are the ones that have the sideshow banner artwork created by Marie Roberts. Artist Marie Roberts has been creating the artwork for Coney Island USA for the past 15 years. American sideshow banners is a genre. I'm trying to push that forward if I can, maybe make a little bit of a mark on history. Roberts and other local artists and designers are making an impression. Over at Neighborhoodies, Brooklyn custom wear is in high demand. The store may be located under the Manhattan Bridge, but here, it's all about the County of Kings. We do have a very strong New York and specifically Brooklyn contingent. I mean, since we're in Dumbo, we get a lot of Dumbo type of interest, but uh, I think it's a, it's a cross between um, Williamsburg, Bed-Stuy. It's really, really spread. And this affinity for Brooklyn is spreading to other states, too. My husband likes kind of vintage-style T-shirts with the soft, comfy cotton, and so I was drawn right in. So I wanted to bring him something home from Brooklyn. Uh, Brooklyn has been a joke for the last hundred years. There's this, like, 
ugly set stepsister notion about Brooklyn. And I think the young people that are creating here, the artists that are moving in, I think that maybe subconsciously they're taking this and turning it around. And what about the mystique of Manhattan? Forget about it. Tammy Cozier for 219 West. Bow ties, tailored suits, and button downs are not usually associated with women's fashion, but the founders of the Brooklyn based fashion brand Mari Macho have created a line of clothing for women who prefer a more dandy approach to dress. 219 West reporter Amy Stratton has this fashion forward story. Butch, masculine of center, tomboy, dandy. These are all words that define the target market the founders of the up-and-coming Brooklyn-based fashion company Marimacho hope to attract. The dynamic duo behind the brand is Yvette Ale and Crystal Gonzalez, business partners and life partners. The two Latinas chose to name their company after a word reclaimed from their culture. Marimacho is a Spanish word, it's slang, that uh, denotates tomboy, uh, but connotates dyke, so it's pejorative. Uh, that I find, um, I find it to be a particularly powerful, meaningful word. Ale and Gonzalez have taken a for us, by us approach to business, coming up with a clothing line for women who prefer the less form-fitting cut of menswear. So a lot of uh, clothes for women uh, emphasizes your hips, your breasts, etc. It creates sort of an hourglass shape is the, the feminine ideal. Uh, whereas a person, a woman that's masculine identified m might not want to emphasize those parts of their body, uh, wants to create a, a straighter look. Gonzalez is a woman who considers herself masculine of center and wants to wear clothes that follow this gender expression. So feeling like I have a shirt on that doesn't highlight my boobs, that doesn't make my hips look big, all of that is sort of is really, really I essential. Uh, to me, uh, feeling like I am presenting myself to the world in the way that I feel myself to be. This type of female fashion gender bending is nothing new, says fashion culture and theory professor Eugenia Paolicelli. The figure of the dandy and uh, dandism uh, started in, in the 19th century. It was at this time that in dandism, uh, was a sort of a reaction to that uh, bourgeois kind of male dress. And during the Hollywood heyday of the 1930s, a woman sporting men's clothes held a certain allure for both sexes. Do you remember, you know, a certain uh, uh, hat or a outfit uh, uh, that uh, Marlene Dietrich uh, wore in a film like Morocco, actually it was the first time you see a tuxedo, a woman in tuxedo. Um, so really uh, breaking that kind of gender barrier. So this is one extreme example, but very important example. Paola Celli says that around this time, women were no longer passive receivers of ideas of beauty. Women were becoming agents of their own image, making themselves more attractive, but not necessarily for men. The team behind Mari Macho is the new agent of the dandy aesthetic. Dandy fashion is very much inspired by kind of like the southern gentleman look, um, characterized by bow ties. Um, the, the palette can be... Um, can incorporate some softer tones and colors, pink, uh, light blues. So it has like a mixture of the feminine, uh, but still very much masculine. But is there really a market for this clothing line? Susan Herr is a self-identified transgressor of men's fashion and creator of the website DapperQ.com. Herr feels the queer community is often left out of the fashion conversation. I think that Mari Macho is addressing a real market need. There are many, many people who write into Dapper Q, people who are passionate about wanting to look good, they're not finding what they need in the men's section or the women's section. They're not reading what they need to read in GQ or in Vogue. There is this in-between space that Mari Macho fills. Her believes the for us bias approach is what sets Mari Macho apart and what makes them sensitive to the needs of their target market. There are department stores in this city that will not allow us to change clothes in the men's department. I'm not talking about a shared dressing room. I'm talking about one dressing room with one door, Filene's in Chelsea, the gayest neighborhood in America, makes me go to the next floor to try something on. So how do I come back three times to try something else on? Policelli says clothing is a language and is a form of nonverbal communication. It's a social uh, experience. 
And um, the fact that um, you want to make sure you communicate what you feel, which is a very personal uh, thing, but also what you choose to be, because it's not just what you feel, but what you choose to be, uh, and you want to, to be able to communicate that and then to feel comfortable in your clothes, you know, with this identity. Since we've launched the website, we've gotten a lot of emails from all over of people that, um, you know, are saying thank you, you know, I've been wanting to do this or I've always thought that this would be amazing, I have such a hard time finding clothing and I think that this is going to be really great. And so I think that that is, um, that's how we're helping. And having a personal as well as professional relationship has been helpful for them. We know each other really, really well. So I think because of that, we, uh, we help each other uh, be more productive, more creative, uh, take more risks. We also know each other's strengths and weaknesses, so we can help um, fill in the gaps or um, let a person have more space to express themselves where we know that they're strongest at. And at the same time, develop a new line of clothing that lets Mari Machos feel dandy about themselves. For 219 West, I'm Amy Stratton. Generations have come to New York City to find fame and fortune. Musicians, artists, and actors among them. And now, if the trend continues, young video game developers might be the next crowd to come to New York. 219 West reporter Thomas Chan has a story. Here in the corner of Williamsburg, there's a new venue for the arts. Video game arts, that is. The place is called Baby Castles, a joint that's half art gallery, half arcade. Baby Castles was recently settling into its new Williamsburg home. To mark the occasion, Baby Castles members opened the space with, what else, a weekend-long session of video game making. We have a room full of people that have all agreed to come together this weekend and spend 48 hours making games together. But with a little twist. The theme is love. love. The games you'll find at Baby Castles are a little out of the mainstream. Not Grand Theft Auto or Halo or just about anything with a marketing budget, but little games by small teams with an idea. Games like Jesus vs. the Dinosaurs, a Tetris-inspired demolition derby between God and Darwin, or Hot Throttle, which seems to be about men who pretend to be cars and then race in the buff. We're not a part of the sort of the New York arts culture in the same way that writing for television or making a film or uh, gallery openings and you know underground music and stuff like that, the way that those things are. And I think that part of getting those insanely talented people from all these other disciplines to be a part of like to be a part of the game scene is in part by having a game scene that's accessible to them while they're starting out here. Many of the contributors at Baby Castles are also employed in the local games industry. It's an industry that essentially only came into existence in the last eight years. In 2003, there were fewer than five game developers in the Big Apple, according to a report by the Center for an Urban Future. Now, local game developers employ 1,200 workers in 85 firms. Nikita Mikros is one of the oldest local vets in this young industry. An artist by training, he was inspired by the release of Warcraft 2, now a classic genre-defining game. It was like a beam from heaven had just kind of entered our brains. I think we literally played for like three days straight. We just, we couldn't stop playing it. Maybe like go catch some sleep for an hour or two and then like, you know, wake up again and like start playing more Warcraft 2. And we were, we were just like, okay, well, this, this is the greatest thing ever. We have, we, we have to make video games. This is what we have to do. Mikos makes his living selling games on the iPhone app store and selling game content to the city's traditional media houses like advertising agencies looking to expand their web offerings. Mikros works with a team of six out of a small one-room office in Dumble, but his biggest challenge had always been the cost of doing business in New York. What's made game development possible in New York City is this, cheap abundant technology driving down the cost of creating, selling, and playing video games. Everything a game developer needs, from the programming tools, to the platforms on which we play, to even just the plain old computers, all of it much cheaper than it was 10 years ago. Most local developers take advantage of the lowered costs by working on so-called casual games, the kind of titles you'd play maybe on the train or on Facebook for 15 minutes at a time. 
They're cheap to make by small teams and have recently accounted for most of the economic growth in the video games industry as a whole. There's one more reason why game developers choose to work in New York City. New York City itself. There's a certain kind of programmer who is going to appreciate, recognize, and value the, the energy that New York City has. Frank Lentz is the interim director of New York University's Game Center. He's the head of a three-year-old department dedicated to graduating a generation of local video game designers. The Game Center hosts classes, invited speakers, and, much like baby castles, exhibitions of artful games. Lance wants New York City to become a focal point for this kind of work. Games are interactivity as an art form, right? Games are interactivity for its own sake. Uh, New York City has certain, for, for like economic reasons, it's not the place where you see a lot of big budget mainstream video game development happen. Um, and uh, as a result, our scene is maybe smaller and, and less developed than uh, in, on the West Coast, but the game industry itself is changing. And that's what so many aspiring and veteran video game makers see in the Big Apple, already the city where so many generations of artists have tried to make it big. Go to New York City. If you want to be a painter, you go to New York City. Uh, if you want to be uh, an important uh, game developer, um, making you know kind of groundbreaking work, um, contributing to you know the you know indie or, or underground stuff in a way that really matters. Maybe you have to come to New York City. Okay. Thomas Chan, two nineteen West. Jewelry for the home is still handmade in one New York City factory. After more than a century, the Garin Foundry is using the methods of the nineteenth century to decorate twenty first century homes. Two nineteen West reporter Jenny Hamlet takes us on a tour. Buried in the heart of Greenwich Village is a treasure trove of glitz and glamour. But these gems are not jewellery. They are doorknobs, handles, fixtures and fittings. Handcrafted jewels for the home. Made on site here in New York City's last surviving foundry. I try to preserve the arts here and um, most, most foundries have, have closed down. You know, we're like the oldest manufacturer left. The importance, I think, of getting hardware here, if for no other reason, would be to keep the craft alive. The story of P.E. Garin is of a business frozen in a gilded age, prospering in a city of constant change. Architect Robert Farrell remembers his first visit to the store. I was absolutely shocked. I thought I was stepping into an entirely separate world. The fact that P.E. Garin still exists as a legacy in New York City is very comforting. Survival is in the company's genetics, started by a journey from France by Pierre-Emmanuel Guerin in 1852. He was kind of a, an innovator too in how he manufactured material, how he marketed material, which is probably one of the, the testaments to the fact that we're still in business. The business remains in the family, descended down the Guerin family line, orphan children and a chance romance caused it to be inherited by the Ward family. Garen's son was living above the store here in the duplex, and he was getting old, and I think he had diabetes. He lost a leg, and um, Aunt Madge cleaned the apartment once a week, and after like five years of cleaning the apartment, she, ma she, married, uh, she married Emmanuel Pierre. Andy Ward's father took over from Aunt Madge and persuaded him to try the business. He said, if you come and work for me, I'll give you five years of my time. You have to live at home, you drive me in New York every day, drive me out of New York every day. With the help of some feline French descendants, Andy has run the business for almost 30 years. The manufacturing is almost identical to the methods of the 19th century. After a pattern is chosen from the thousands here in the pattern room, the piece will travel upstairs to the top floor foundry where a mold is made by making an impression in sand. Once a week, typically, they pour the molten bronze or brass into these sand molds and then come out with your cast piece. That then goes downstairs and it gets machined and filed and fit and chased. A grand home in Columbia Heights, Brooklyn, is where Robert Farrell has brought the Guerin's details to life. It's the difference between custom jewelry and real jewelry. Well, the quality of the detail can elevate the entire project. But in preserving history, is P.E. Guerin sacrificing their own future? We're simply not as profitable as we could be. We're not as efficient as we could be. Well, I have six kids. <laughs> I have one in medical school all the way down to a uh, 
a five-year-old. So hopefully we'll go on to another hundred years, but who knows? <laughs> Jennifer Hamblet, New York City. The Dominican Republic and Haiti share the island of Hispaniola. Despite their differences in language, tradition, and customs, they share a passion for music. Here in New York, the group Kalunga is helping these two communities reconnect to their common roots. <laughs> Kalunga came out, I think, out of a need within the community to express um, our African roots within the Dominican community. I'm from Haiti. It was associated with the poor, to really tell you. The music was associated with people wearing flip-flops, dirt on their feet. I was not allowed to learn it in, in Haiti. I, it was my opportunity to learn my own culture here, I'm sad to say. The new generation of people who are coming, who are probably being Western, you know, have a Western education here, which is not back in the island, don't have those type of mental shackles or any type of mental restrictions towards what our roots are really, because we don't, we are not, we're not being fed the dogma that was being fed to our to our previous generations of parents and people who were told to, no, stay away from the Haitians or stay away from your African roots. We have uh, a lot of Afro-Dominican styles which I was not aware of when I was a child. I was part of, like any, everybody else, I was part of popular culture who understood merengue, salsa, bachata, sal, you know, those type of styles, but they didn't really know that we even had Afro-Caribbean roots when I was growing up. I didn't understand it until I came to the United States and I found it here. We come here every Sunday and we play until the, they kick us out, if you will. Um, and basically it's our way of that keeping the culture alive, you know, in a foreign land and making sure that, you know, we still keep our roots with us. Since we don't have a, 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 a chapel, if you will, or a mosque or a synagogue, we have nature and we have the trees and we have the instruments and we just put it together and we just do us and we just keep it going, keep it alive. Basically, stumbled upon this music here on 72nd Street. When Kalunga came into the picture, I said to myself, wow, what, is, what a great idea. The unity that we promote between Dominicans and Haitians, it is mind-blowing, it is God-blessing. Continue doing his work, hopefully, and praying to the Creator, uh, to, you know, try to break the mental shackles, if you will, of, of that border. Something like what's going on now is something that's fairly new, I would say in the last 10 to 12, 14 years maybe, where not only Dominican Haitians, but Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Haitians, and Cubans, and all the types of people from the diaspora, from the Caribbean diaspora have been here, have been expressing themselves because they have either found Bomba from Puerto Rico, Palo from Dominican Republic, Rara from Haiti, or Rumba from, from Cuba. People who have been finding that, or also finding each other, finding that they have those things in common here. That's it for this month's edition of 219 West from the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. Thank you for watching. I'm Anais Morales. And I'm Judy Lee. We'll be back next month with more stories from the five boroughs. In the meantime, don't forget to check out our podcasts on iTunes and follow us on Twitter. From all of us here at 219 West, thanks for watching.